we're, we're doing the whole chapter tonight of chapter 3. And you're thinking, this is the grand finale, but it's not. Uh, because Jonah's like us. You know, we, we can say Jonah was terrible because he reigned from God. True. Jonah got right with God. True. Jonah was used by God to bring revival to them. Is true. But then Jonah got mad at God. I mean, that, that's how the, how the story ends. So the whole last chapter of it is just this debate with God and how God confronts him and things. And so we're going to get into that our, our, ourselves. But this time, is, it, we're, we're talking about how Jonah was this story of going from uh, running to revival. He went from one extreme to the next. Uh, but the idea of revival really just boggles our mind as if that is even possible. Now, we would say, amen, Jonah, run to Nineveh because God's going to do great things. It, you say, how is that? Because well, he had this commandment and this calling to do so. But if, if God could do that for Nineveh, could God do that for us? You think about it. I mean, but isn't it easier to get upset that Jonah didn't run to preach the gospel to a pagan city, but we're reluctant to do ourselves? But I think the reason is because when you think of things being so bad, you know, uh, it's, it's not exactly, I mean, if you think about the things that are going on in our culture and our world today, did you guys see that there was another school shooting uh, that happened around us? Uh, and, and I just saw it passing. I have not even read one article other than people saying pray for uh, that area and stuff like that. And just, it just seems to be a regular thing. What's up, Calvin? Um, it, it seems to be a regular thing that uh, just is the, the, the depravity of the, the world that's going on around us. And then you look at uh, the voting, how we were like so excited about the, the abortion laws changing and, and doing away with it. And then they threw it to the state and then the states made it far worse. And we're just like, man, things are just so bad. And they are bad. They, they truly are bad. Did you guys know that Columbus, Ohio is one of the fifth leading cities for human trafficking? For human trafficking, we think of this issue being so bad. It, that, that's the area, that's the world that we live in is, is, all, is, is surrounded with that. When you, when you look at uh, the culture of struggling with transgender and you deal with the, the, the gay rights and the, the, the White House being like, I'm just saying overall, it's bad, but not as bad as Nineveh. So if God can do great things through one person reaching this city, could God do great things through us? Now, I know it's easy to be like, hey, amen, yes, that's true. But do we truly believe that? Because wouldn't it be running, we'd be running to the loss and being on fire or praying and things like that, but somewhere in the back of our minds, we're thinking, yeah, it's, just, it's just bad. You know, just, I, I, I think we've lost sight of, of what it could be. And, and don't get me wrong, it is, it is bad. But are we looking at how great the problem is or how great our God is? And, I, and, I, and I, I know that we live in a different age, day and age than even then, then because we're living in, in times and times of change and stuff like that. <clears throat> but if we say, Pastor Tony, let's be honest, America's too far gone, then I have a name for you. I'd call you Jonah. That's just the truth. If we have that mindset, then this, the, the, these four chapters are written to us. Because it, like we talked about last week, it wasn't just about Jonah and the whale. And we make a big deal out of the, the whole book of Jonah. Like, let me tell you about Jonah and the whale. It was really about the gospel in Nineveh. We, we make it about his failing and going back. But really, the reality of the story was the fact that God had a heart to save these people. And, and so we're going to start in chapter 3, verse 1. And we kind of alluded to some of this last week. Um, so the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto the, the preaching that I bid thee. So Nineveh is, is a notable city in the Bible, the city of Assyria. Uh, it, it, it became not, not, just, not just bad people. They were, they were the, uh, the, the enemy, longtime enemy of Israel. So you, you think of like some sort of big nation that we would go up against. So, I mean, this, they had this long time history of going up, up against them is, is one that wanted to take them out. And I don't know if you guys realize this. It's now today would be modern Iraq. So just kind of put in, uh, in their history there. Uh, they were known for their, when it says that great city, they were known for their wealth. They were known for their power. 
They were known for their popularity and their things. So this place was like a magnet for sin. Okay, it would be like we, we've talked about the church of Corinth a while back when I was doing a, a sermon series on that and talked about how it was a place that it wasn't just, it wasn't just like Columbus, Ohio. It would have been more like Las Vegas or New York or someplace like that. A lot of, a lot of things going on. If you were looking for some sort of sinful activity, you could find it there. They had false gods. They had false religion. If somebody traveled to the city, they'd be like, what are you looking for? We've got it. All right, we've got it. I mean, it was all sorts of pleasures and things like that. But because of the sin issues that they had, they were, they were known for their cruelty uh, and, and idolatry. They, they were just extremely cruel people. And, and I know that we, when we talked about those, we talked about when he said, go to that great city and cry against them. In his mind, he was realizing that, that they, would, they were known for like torturing people and skinning them alive. That, that this wasn't just like, they're really bad and they need Jesus. No, I mean, they were really bad and they would kill you. And in this, it's a kind of like what we think of like modern day Hamas and those kind of things. And, and I know we've talked about all this, but understanding not just the fact that he was fearful to go in, but if I went in, would they even care? Would they even listen? Is, is anything going to change? It's not they're going to be like, hey guys, settle down. There's a preacher in town. Let's show him a little respect. They would be like, Let's rise up and kill that guy because we don't care. They were known for this. They, they, they were known for having temples to foreign gods. It, it's not even like they just didn't believe in God. They had their own false gods. They were set in their ways. But the thing is, and the truth is that God was about to change this. And this is the whole point of this story. God brings revival. God doesn't just bring change. God brings revival to this city. I mean, I'm talking about them ripping off their clothes, falling on their feet, uh, their faces before God and crying out to God, begging God for mercy. Now, I'm not talking about they were like, okay, we'll shut down this for the weekend and, and stop drinking for a day. I mean, they, they went into this major revival uh, and, and God was doing great things. Now, when I say revival, what do you guys think of when we think of the word revival today? What, what comes to mind? What, whether it's right or wrong, what, what comes to mind with revival? People repenting? What else? People being saved. Renewal. Renewal. Uh, just, just things that have fallen away or fallen apart. But really to revive, you think about, you know, if somebody was dead or passing away or whatever and you, and you were to take the, 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 the pads and put it on their chest and clear, or, you know, it's like whatever, and trying to bring them back to life. Think about when the Bible talks about our spiritual condition without Christ. It's not that he's just trying to revive what, was, what, what is fading. The Bible says that we are dead in our trespasses and sins. Now, I don't know about you guys. When you think about what it would take to raise the dead, that's literally Noah's like, or Noah, uh, Jonah. <laughs> I, I've, I've preached on a lot of characters in the last six weeks, you know, <laughs> like going through Hebrews. Um, but he's like, Lord, they are as spiritual dead as, as you could possibly get. There's no life. There's no joy. There's no nothing in them. And, and that's why Ephesians 2, 1 is so powerful when you talk about revival. And, and you have he quickened, literally made alive who were dead in their trespasses and sins. Literally like no spiritual pulse whatsoever. They are so far gone. And I know this really reminds me even a little bit of what I preached on Sunday with the story of Rahab. It's like you, you go into a city and they're all wicked sinners and all this stuff. And in the middle of that, you've got this woman that, this woman that runs a prostitution ring. You know, it's like, and God saves her just to say, talk about the power of the gospel. Well, this is a whole city of Rahab's, okay? And God was about to bring revival to this wicked city. So we looked at his fear, his running, him getting stuck, him getting right, all the personal things of that. But why does God do a work in our lives? Why does God change us and stir us and revive us? And why does God have the church to provoke one another to love and good works? It's not so that we can gather the next Sunday again and sing a song about the goodness of God. It is important that we do that. But if we don't take it to, to seek and to save that which is lost and to be revived to go out and share things, then all we're doing is sitting around talking about the problem and not making a difference. And the word of the Lord came again to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. God speaks to him again, puts him in there. He surrenders. And this is what we learn from this. Is number one is we all have a responsibility. 
Now, I, I want to give you an illustration, and I, I want you guys to hang with me as I talk through this. God gave me three kids. I love them to death. My role as a dad is a lot different than it used to be. It's weird. Um, I've only got one kid in school. I've got two that are grown adults. Actually, I have three that are grown adults. Morgan's 17, so she's going in 18. So I have three uh, almost grown adults. And uh, I, I, I keep this in mind. For unto whomsoever much is given, when God gives me much, of him shall it be required. If I bless you with something, I, it's, it's required. Not optional. The blessings come from God. I've got a requirement by God to take care of those. And whom we have committed much of him will he ask the more. So blessings come with responsibility. Too much is giving, much shall be required. And you say, Tony, God gave your kids. And I'm going to say amen to that. The, some, some of the greatest blessings in my life is my kids. So it's required of me by God to lead them, educate them, care for them, provide for them, train them, feed them, teach them to love God, teach them to know God. But what would you say if I never did my responsibility? If, let, let's say you found out that I don't feed my kids. You, you know what I'm saying? You found if kids came up and, and were telling you about, or I never educated, I kept them home, or they got sick and I never helped them, whatever. But I, but I was so proud as a dad that I walked around all the time showing you pictures like, I'm so proud of my kids and things. And you're like, why, why do you get so amped up on bragging on that, but you're not doing what you should do to take care of this? They're like, well, what do you mean? It's like, you've been blessed in so many ways. You're responsible to do this in this way. You would say that you don't really get it because if I, if I care about my kids and I love my kids, then I'm going to recognize the responsibility that I have to take care of them. So you guys know where I'm going with this. If we are saved, too much is given, and we're celebrate that, I'm saved and going to heaven. But it's also, do we forget the second part? Much is required. That, that literally, if I bless you in this way, then you have a responsibility, not just to brag and say, man, God's been so good to me, and I have so many blessings, to gather in a room and talk about, I'm going to heaven, and praise God, I'm going to heaven. But he said, what are you doing with your, your responsibility? See, Jonah recognized the responsibility. Not at first, he struggled with it. In verse three, and Jonah rose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. So you, our responsibility requires action. It requires action. If the son of man came to seek and to save that which is lost, th 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 this literally means that it's seeking and to save that which is lost, that Jesus was active in the mission of doing what he did. Seeking is an action. Um, I put Luke, Luke 19 in here when he was talking about this and Jesus sat in there to occupy when he talked about the mission that he's given to occupy till I come, to stay busy. And guys, do we, I, I think we're good at staying busy, but I don't think it's always busy doing the work that God's given us to do. Uh, the, the, the root word to this literally mean a busy, literally means to, uh, uh, to do what matters or be about the business or the work. And, and I think that we're, we're good at doing that, but I, 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 and I really do. I think that God's blessed us in a lot of ways, that we're actively trying to en engage in the community. And, and I'm looking at people that do food pantry and outreach and church on Sunday and mission work and evangelism and all of these things. Uh, but we've got to understand that it requires, it, it's required of us to do this. It's not just doing good deeds. It's required of us to do this. It says that he did according to the word of the Lord. It requires obedience. It's not an option. So think about this. If we get so busy, and well, let, let, me, let, let me talk about this another way. I, I say this all the time, but it, it's true. Do you guys believe that Jesus is coming soon? Yes. And I, mean, I, and I know we say that. I, when I was a kid, pastors would say that. It was just like, Jesus is coming soon. We'd all say yes. And we'd say yes because I think we were trained to say yes. But with the world around us, I mean, I'm telling you, you talk about the writing on the wall and things being so blatantly clear, even to, I, guys, I'm serious about it, even to the point where the world will, will call the church and start asking them questions, asking us questions, do you think that God's coming soon? Or do you think this stuff that's happening is dealing with the Bible? And absolutely, there, there's so many things that have caught our attention but if we're, if we're that convinced that God is coming soon, are we that convinced also to be about the Father's business? And, and that's why God calls us to the obedience of this. 
It's not just do you believe this part of Scripture that is coming true, uh, that it's coming true of all these things happen, but do you believe that Jesus is coming soon? And what are we doing for the, the work of God while, while we wait? That's why I, I'm, I'm, I'm all in on the project that we're doing right now. I, I really am. I mean, it's, it's a mess in there. It's been, it's been a lot of crazy work and crazy hours, and Brent Matheny and Eigel have been working crazy with that. But the thing is, we're trying to do all this for the sake of the gospel, that we can have this production room to get the gospel out to more people and d just step into the great need that's out there because I believe that Jesus is coming soon. And I believe that time is of the essence. And I, and I believe, I've put this in your notes, that I believe that he, there's an urgency to it. When Jonah began to enter the city a day's journey, and cried saying, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. 40 days. I, I wish we had a countdown. I really do. But we don't, guys. We don't. I think the writing's on the wall. I think the Bible says that when you see these things, know that the time is nigh, know that the time is near. I, I believe all these things is true. I really do. They had a countdown. We don't have a countdown. But would we, how would we act differently if we did? Have you ever thought about that? Just think about that in reality. Who would you, if you knew that Jesus said, I'm, gonna be, I'm coming back in six days, who would you call? And I'm, I'm not saying who would you call tonight. I'm not saying that. If we had that message right now, everyone in this room would get up and walk out. Have you ever thought about that? And you would go to that person that you know is not saved and you would go beat on their door until they open it up or you'd kick it down. <laughs> it would be different. I, I've got lost loved ones in my family right now and... And I have thought, my, my mom just asked me the other day, she says, when's the t last time that you spoke to aunt so-and-so? And I said, mom, I've not talked to her in a while. And, and she says, man, I, I, she's heavy in my heart because I know she's not saved. I'm thinking, what, is, what has filled my time so much that I can't call aunt so-and-so just to check on her or to stir up the gospel again if I truly believe Jesus could come back at any minute and amen. Well, if, if I believe that there should be an urgency. Jonah was going to preach this message that God was going to destroy the city in, in 40 days and, and that time was running out and, 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 and it made a difference. I, I think, would it make a difference? I don't know. Do you guys think, and I'm, I'm, I'm just talking out loud right now. I know I'm talking through what's going through my head or whatever. Do you think that Christians would act different if Jesus said, I'm coming back in a week? I hope so. It's, it's, it's a different perspective when you think of the urgency. And, and, and I know that we know this, but let me just say it. Let me just say it. Um, the world needs Jesus because hell is real. Amen. I mean, the, the reality, if you read the end of Revelation, it will shake you to the core. And, and, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to beat us up by any means. I'm trying to stir us up is what I'm trying to do. Have you ever put a name in, in, in the slots of when, in Revelation? And he says, and the, and the dead, great and small, were brought before the Lord. And the, and the dead, great and small, uh, were, the books were opened. And another book was opened, the book of life. And they that were not found in the book of life, I'm paraphrasing, by the way, uh, was cast into the lake of fire. Have you ever thought about the family members that that would represent? And you say, man, I don't want to think like that. Is it better for us to think like that now than to view it later? I mean, when it, when it comes to this, I don't, I don't know. This really, man, I'm telling you, this really stirred me as it got into this. And let's, let's just get in this. I, he said, go to that city, deliver my words. This is what he said. Preach unto them the preaching that I bid thee. And, and I think part of it is the fact that we know this is true and we know there's an urgency and we know they're going to hell, but what can I do? What can I do? I don't, I, cause I can't change the hearts and minds of people. I can't, as, as, as much as you've lectured your kids or whoever they're at trying to get them to do right or come to church or whatever. But I think this is powerful because you take Jonah over here that is like, God, I don't know what to do. And then you take the city that they're like, we'll rip your head off and like trying to try to connect those two pieces together. And God says to him, like, I got a plan. This is the plan. Just go tell them this. 
And Jonah comes and he preached the message. Jonah didn't have to run to his office and like, Lord, I need a really good three-point outline. Lord, I, I need a really good illustration for this. When Jonah walked into the city, literally, let me say, preach unto them the preaching that I bid thee. He literally says, here's your message. Here's your four-point outline or whatever. Just go preach this. This is what happened. And, and so he goes and preaches this message. So uh, we hold the power to change lives. I guarantee you that Jonah was apprehensive. I would be. You can imagine entering to the city, being Jonah. Okay, first, he probably smelled really bad. All right, Jonah smelled really bad. And, and he walks into this city. Where do you start? It would kind of be like taking an independent Baptist and having them go evangelize on the streets of Las Vegas in the middle of July or something. You know, it's just like, I shouldn't be here. And Whoa, what is that? You know, just like... As he, as he walks into the city, like, what am I doing here? Why am I here? Where do you start? I mean, do you just walk into the first tavern and just start preaching? I mean, do you do it on the streets? I mean, do you rent out a place, whatever? I, and I know that the Bible just says, and he went in there and started preaching the gospel, whatever. But where do you, where do you start? You talk about a, being a street preacher or whatever, but have you ever thought, like Jonah being by himself, it's one thing if you get to go, like we do a lot of stuff with our staff together, and it's like, what do you guys think? Well, let's get together and pray. Lord, help us with that. Jonah's by himself, like, Lord, here I am. Where do I start? What do I say? And I can't even, I don't know how it is, but I imagine him just like, um, like walking into the city and just getting a corner and like, God wants to do a great work. <clears throat> you know, like, like nervous to like get the message out and like, all the things that God's going to say. Now, I, I can tell you guys, I've done a lot of funerals. And I have done them for people in the church. And I've done funerals for people that I did not know at all. Literally, I walk in there and have to say, uh, who's, who's the, the spouse and, and all these things. And, and because I don't turn down funerals, I will never turn down funerals. Because the one thing that I require, as long as I can share the gospel... I will always accept any funeral that's ever been asked. And, and the staff knows that, and I've been done that my entire ministry, and our, I know all the pastors on staff feel that way. I'll do that. But I can tell you, when they say, oh, yeah, share, share the things from the Bible, they don't always know what I mean by that. And I'm not like hellfire and brimstone when I'm preaching a funeral or whatever. I'm, I'm, I'm going to give the truth. But I have been in environments that I'm thinking people roll their eyes while I'm preaching. I've, I've had people yawn or look at me. I've had people gesture to me like, you know, like, what are you doing? And like, uh, I, I, I've done funerals to where people will just drop their heads and not even, uh, it's cold in there. I'll just put it like that. I don't mean physically cold. It's just like the environment's like weird. And, and I've done them for like Christians in a church and stuff. And I'm used to that. I'm used to like, God loves you. And, you know, he's come to save you. And there's a better life. And everybody being amen and nodding their head. What do you do when there's nobody nodding their head? Nobody's agreeing. Nobody's saying amen. Nobody's like whatever. And, 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 and it doesn't happen a lot. And I'm thinking it is uncomfortable. And I'll get done and stand off to the side and not one person acknowledges my existence. Nobody person comes up to me and says, I gave my life to Jesus. Whatever is just stone cold. The whole city was that. I, I, I think we just need to put in perspective what's going on. He, he's... He's standing there talking as he's standing next to prostitutes, drunks, and people fighting. And the message that he preached is in verse 4, and none of us shall be overthrown. How is that? It's not God loves you and God's going to do great things. God's about to destroy all of you. You're all going to suffer and die. He's preaching the preaching that God told him to do. But the thing is, the message bothered them. The message spoke to their hearts. Jonah was not expecting this because he was expecting his words to reach their heads. But when it's God's words, it reaches their hearts. And this is, this is so cool when you start thinking about it. Everything, God works through the words. And, and, and I know I've preached and talked about stuff like this, but if you go back to Genesis and God says, let there be light, and there was light, there, there was enough power in the words of God to create the universe. 
and DNA and horses and oceans all by speaking. His words held the power to do that. Now, God could have done things by building or assembling or whatever, but he didn't do it. He did it by the words of his mouth. And then today we have the word of God. Is this any less powerful than the words that were spoken at the beginning of creation that create the galaxies and the Milky Way? It's not. So let me, let me put it like this. God was saying, I'm going to take you to Nineveh and I want you to go in there. But when you open this up and you begin to speak from your heart the words of God, the message that I gave you, he said the power that created the universe is the same power that's going to be un unveiled on the people in the hearts of the people that are there. Do you, you know why we don't see revival today? Because I think we try to pamper to the, the, the culture around us or not offending people or we try to speak in such a way that it's going to gather a crowd or build up our reputation rather than speaking the words of God. Because when it's this, it's authority. When it's this, it's power. When it's this, it's conviction. When we start telling cute stories and we start watering down scripture, we're entertaining people, but we're not. And we can gather crowds, but we're not going to see life change. Life change comes from the power of the word of God. At the word of Jesus, demons were cast out. The dead was raised. The word of God today uh, accomplishes. It, it says in Isaiah, it says, So shall my word that goeth forth out of my mouth, it shall not return to me void or empty. It shall accomplish that which I please. So literally, if God said, I'm going to do a work through my word, unleash the word and watch it work. And it shall prosper where I send it. it. It is so powerful to think about this. The word prosper literally means it's going to accomplish something. As the word of God is read, as it's preached, as it's sung, as it's proclaimed, the spirit of God, as Jonah was there, was going out and knocking on the hearts and, and, the, and the lives of people and turning them around. The spirit of God does the work. And then we have in Hebrews for our day and age, the word of God is quick and powerful. It, it's, it's something that Jonah didn't even have is, is the completed word of God. He had a word of God, but we have the word of God. And it pierces the dividing of soul, of soul and spirit and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Literally what it's saying from that is that it pierces to the heart of man. It doesn't just go in and, and, and touch the minds of them or irritate them or, or just say that you're going to be destroyed in 40 days. Who do you think you are? And I'll take you out. And guys, let's go, you know, the stuff that normally would agitate. But as he was preaching it struck to the heart and mind of those people that brought conviction that we're going we're gonna to be destroyed in 40 days if we don't get our hearts right. That's the difference of it. Isaiah 55 verse 11, it will not return to me void. It will never return empty. I've, I've preached messages before that I thought, man, that, that did nothing because my illustration didn't go well or something like that. And God's reminded me it was never about your illustration. It was never about your outline. It was the fact that you delivered the truth of God's word. Here's, here's this is so powerful. It's just curious. Has anybody been the sight and sound to watch Jonah? I've asked this before, just curious out of here, okay? So a number of you guys have been here. They, they demonstrate this to where out of all the plays that I've seen at sight and sound, this has been one of the most powerful, and I tried. Things are so complicated to play in church now because of copyright laws. Like, you have to get permissions and all this other stuff, so it's not like I'm just going to pull something up on YouTube and play it. If I play it on that screen in this environment, I have to have permission. So I couldn't do things. But anyways, I wanted to play this clip for you. Jonah goes in, and he's preaching, and, and it shows these people that literally started falling down on their knees and weeping. And I'm like... That, that one, no, that didn't happen like that. I mean, just, it's just, you know, like it's kind of over dramatic and whatever. And then these people started telling other people and they started falling on there. And before long, the whole city of Nineveh is literally on their hands and knees, lifting up their hands and crying out to God, to begging God to spare their life. Now that was a drama. This is the truth. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast, and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. Isn't that powerful? 
in light of everything that we've talked about, uh, it, it would be like if I said, uh, you know, Pastor Matt Hodge went to Las Vegas and he started preaching and, and, and they started shutting off the, the, off the casinos and like just closing the bars and people are coming out on the streets and you're thinking that would never happen. It is if that's what God wants to happen. And that's, that's the point of this. They, from the greatest of them, even to, because the word of God convicts. Uh, it, it is so convicting. I, I, know, I don't know if you guys remember this, so I'm just going to tell you again. Does anybody remember the story of how my daughter got saved, Morgan got saved? So she made a profession of faith when she was a little girl. And I remember her coming to me and started talking to me about getting saved. And I was like, uh, I knew that she was at the maturity level, that she was ready for this. And so I was going to sit her down and like walk her through the plane of salvation, whatever. And she said, Dad, I already got saved. I'm like, what? She goes, yeah, I already got saved. I know I'm saved. I'm asking you about baptism and stuff like that. I'm like, Morgan, sweetie, when did you get saved? And she said, Dad, when we, we had the churchwide movie night, we went to, I think, War Room. As a church, we saw it. She said, halfway through that, I got under conviction and I asked God to save me in the theater watching War Room. And I am like, what in the world? And it is a powerful, powerful movie or whatever. And, 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 and I mean, it is so gospel centered that those movies are. But the, the, the word of God went forth through the Kendrick brothers, through the, who are both pastors, uh, uh, preaching through that thing, and it, and it convicts hearts. And in that moment, she accepted Jesus Christ as a personal Savior. It, it, it can convict, and the word convict literally means like to convince, to open up the eyes of the lost and say, I need to be saved. And, 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 and it says in verse 6, the word of the Lord came unto the king of Nineveh. It spread to him. And I don't know how. I don't, I don't know if there was a, an appointment like that we talked about on Sunday that God set this up. I don't know if other people ran in that were saved and they did this. And he arose from his throne and laid his robe from him and covered with sackcloth and sat in ashes. The Bible says his word is like a fire. It's like a hammer that breaketh the rock into pieces. And the rest of this story just talks about how the gospel spread. Verse uh, 7, and, and he caused to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh and a decree unto the king of, and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast nor flock taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water, but let the man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn everyone from his evil way and the violence that is in their hands. And who can tell and the Lord will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anchor that we perish not. I, we talk about sin spreading, and that does. I mean, sin spreads like crazy. But I tell you, the gospel, when it begins to spread, is more powerful than any sin. And that's what's happening. It's, it's overcoming this place and bringing conviction to where people were literally tearing their clothes and falling on the floor before God. And we're reading it. It's not, like I said, that dramatic presentation was awesome at Sight and Sound Theater. But I believe that if you were there, it would be more incredible than actually what they portrayed. Now, they weren't singing and sink in the streets or whatever, okay, but it wasn't like that. And, and I've been in different times, and I've, I've told you guys different stories in the past. When I was in uh, Bible college, we had a, 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 a conference at the church. And I remember this one night that I went to the conference, and... Um, I got there late because I was working and I went in and sat up in the balcony and found my seat with Jenny. And while they were doing the music at the beginning, a few of the teenagers went to the altar and started praying. And they're just praying and, 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 and I didn't think anything about it because that was not an abnormal thing to happen during a time like that. And then while they were singing, more teens went forward and then somebody got up and testified that somebody got saved. And I'm like, what is going on here? Because it was like, it was, it was sing, 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 announcement, sing, preach, invitation, go home. That's the program we do, people. That's what we do. And God interrupted the program. We went the whole evening. I'm like talking like two, three hours. Nobody preached that night. Nobody preached that night. And all it was was like a giant invitation that people were being saved one after another. I am like, what is going on? 
Later, I found out that there was a group of teens that just was praying for that service, and they fasted and prayed and met periodically throughout the, the, the months leading up to it for that, that God would break through and do something. And it wasn't orchestrated. It wasn't manipulated. It wasn't one more verse, and then we'll be done. It wasn't anything like that. It was just the power of the Word of God convicting lives, and it was spreading through that place like crazy. And it does. And I wrote this. It changes lives. God saw their works and they were turned from their evil way and God repented of the evil. That doesn't mean that God got things right. That's not the terminology there. But God withheld the punishment that was deserved. God showed mercy on these evil people. Why? Because they turned from their wicked ways. And it wasn't the whole point of this story, guys, is not how great Jonah was. It's really about how how, how insignificant he was. And the whole two chapters leading up to it was how he was a scaredy cat. He was a wuss. He, he, was, he was worried. He was afraid. He was thrown overboard. He hit bottom. And then God still picked him up. And he's like brushing off the seaweed, walking into the city, scared to death, like spitting out the words. And all, all it was was God was using him as a spark. He wasn't the revival. The word of God, and that's what's so clear in this passage. Go preach the message that I would give you. I believe that if every church would just preach the message that God's given us, we would see more people saved. There would be life change. There would be conviction. There there would be less divorce in churches and less addiction in churches and less all these other things that happen because the word of God convicts and changes. But as long as we water down the word, as long as we're trying to gather a crowd and say what we think would bring them back the next week, then it's never going to work. It's never going to convict. It might entertain, but it won't convict. If we have it in our mind that God does not work that way, or they won't change, or it won't make a difference, then I'm going to back off and keep my mouth shut. But when we understand that it is, it is this that makes the difference, it is the Bible, it is the truth, and that is just as truth in your family, It's just as true in your life group. It's just as true. It doesn't have to be a crusade. It doesn't have to be a revival. It doesn't have to be all these things that we talk about. And don't get me wrong. God does work in those ways. But God works in the simplicity of just any time we, we, we unleash the word of God and let it do its work.